from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Gorge Beyond Salapunco by August Erleth Being the testament of Claiborne Boyd, the manuscript of Claiborne Boyd, now in the vault of the Library of the University of Buenos Aires, is in three parts. The first two parts were discovered among the effects of Claiborne Boyd left behind in a hotel room in Lima, Peru. The final portion is a piecing together of various letters delivered to Professor Viberto Andros of Lima and of related accounts. The entire manuscript has been released for limited publication only after prolonged discussion among its custodians. It is singularly fortunate that the ability of the human mind to correlate and assimilate facts is limited in relation to the potential knowledge of the universe even as we know it to say nothing of what lies beyond. Fortunate because the Earth's teeming millions, save but for an infinitesimal number, live on blissfully unaware of the dark depths of horror which yawn eternally, not only in strange, out-of-the-way places of the Earth, but often just beyond the sunset or around the next corner. The yawning chasm in time and space and the inconceivably alien things which occupy those terrible lacunae. Less than a year ago, I was engaged upon a leisurely study of Creole culture residing in New Orleans and making occasional trips from that city into the bayou country of the Mississippi Delta region, which was not far from the town of my birth. I had been following this pursuit for perhaps three months when word reached me of the death of my great uncle, Asaf Gilman and of the shipment, at his express direction as contained in his will, of certain of his property to me as the only student remaining among his few living relatives. My great-uncle had been for many years professor of nuclear physics at Harvard, and following his retirement because of age from that university, he had taught briefly at Miskatonic University in Arkham. From this last post, he retired to his home in a suburb of Boston and began to live out his last years in an almost reclusive fashion. I write almost because he broke his seclusion from time to time to make strange secretive trips into all corners of the world, on one of which, while poking about certain unsavory districts of Limehouse in London, he had met his death. A sudden riot of what appeared to be Lascars or decoits from ships and dock involving him and dissipating as suddenly as it had begun, leaving him dead. I had had occasional communications from him, written in a spidery hand and dispatched from various points at which he had touched, from Nome, Alaska, for instance, and Ponapa in the Carolines, from Singapore, Cairo, Krakowicar in Transylvania, Vienna, and many more places. At the beginning of my research into Creole backgrounds, I had received a cryptic postcard sent from Paris, bearing on its face a fine etching of the Bibliothèque Nationale, and on the reverse, a directive from Great Uncle Asaf. If you come upon any evidence of pagan worship, past or present, in your study, I would be obliged if you would collect all data and send it along to me at your earliest convenience. Since, of course, the Creoles, among whom I studied, were largely Roman Catholic in religion, I encountered no such data as he sought. So I did not write to the address in London he gave. Indeed, before I had planned to write to him at all, word of his untimely death reached me. My great uncle's effects followed notice of his death a fortnight later. 
two steamer trunks filled to capacity, if their weight were any indication. At the time of their arrival, I was busy assimilating primary facts about customs and folklore of the Creole country, and for that reason, it was well over a month before I thought to open the trunks and make at least a cursory examination of their contents. When I did finally open them, I discovered that their contents could be divided readily into two parts, a collection of extremely curious pieces, which would have been the delight of any collector of Aboriginal art, and a sheaf of notes, some typewritten, some in my great uncle's spidery script, some merely clippings and letters. Obviously, because the Aboriginal art lent itself most readily to scrutiny, I gave some time to it immediately. After perhaps four hours spent, in an effort at some arrangement, I came to the conclusion that the pieces my great-uncle has so painstakingly collected represented a strange kind of creative progression. My own knowledge of such Aboriginal art was comparatively limited, but my great-uncle had attached adequate notes to the bottoms or backs of most of the pieces, save the patently self-explanatory ones such as the common types of Polynesian masks, for instance. The division of the pieces into groups was in itself interesting. There were approximately 277 of them, making allowance for two or three which might have broken in such a way as to resemble two pieces rather than one. Of this number, probably a quarter of a hundred were of American Indian origin, and the like number of Canadian Indian and Eskimo origin. There were a few scattered pieces which were clearly of Mayan design, and there were a score of Egyptian craftsmanship. Approximately a hundred pieces came out of the African heartland, and two score or so from Oriental sources. Almost all the remainder, and therefore the majority from any one source, were South Pacific in origin, from Polynesia, Micronesia, Melanesia, and Australia. Apart from these, there were perhaps half a dozen pieces, the origin of which were admittedly unknown. These pieces were all extremely unusual, and though differing widely in a superficial fashion from one another, there seemed to be connecting links between them, as if some obscure development had occurred in common in all the racial and culture patterns represented, such links as suggested certain basic similarities between the hideous carvings of the South Pacific and the repellent totems of the Canadian Indians, for instance. And of this odd relationship, my great-uncle had certainly been aware, as his notes indicated. But disappointingly, there was nowhere any clear indication of the underlying thesis of my grand-uncle's research, insofar as these curious artworks were concerned. My great-uncle had clearly lavished most of his care upon the South Pacific pieces which were not, I saw at a glance, the customary mask varieties, though his notes were not in themselves too expository, and it was only in the light of later events that some clarification of the art and of his appended notes occurred to me. Among the South Pacific pieces were several which caught my eye at once. In the order of their impingement upon my awareness they were as follows, with appended notes. One, a human figure surmounted by a bird. Sepik River, New Guinea. Reverse said to exist, but great secrecy attending, uncollected. 2. A piece of tapa cloth from the Tonga Islands. The design a dark green star upon a brown background. First occurrence of the five-pointed star in this area. No other relation. Natives unable to account for design say it is very old. Evidently no contact here since it has lost meaning. 3. Fisherman's God, Cook Islands, not the familiar fishing canoe effigy. Note lack of neck, misshapen torso, tentacles for legs and or arms, no name given by natives. Number 4. Stone Tiki, Marquesas, exciting frog-like head of figure, presumably man, our fingers webbed. Natives, while not worshipping it, endow it with meaning, apparently fear association. 5. Diminutive head. 
clearly a miniature of colossal stone images found on the outer slope of Rano Raraku, typical Easter Island work, found in Panape. Natives call it simply Elder God. 6. Carved Lintel New Zealand, Maori, exquisite workmanship, central figure obviously octopoid, yet not an octopus, but a curious combination of fish, frog, octopus, and man. 7. Carved door jam, Tale, New Caledonia. Note suggestion of five pointed star again. 8. Ancestral figure, carved in tree fern, Ambrum, New Hebrides. Partly human, partly frog like. A representation of true ancestor, some manifest relation to same cult as that of Panape and Innsmouth. Mention of Cthulhu to Ono frightened him. He seemed not to know why. 9. Bearded Mask Ambram Origin Exciting suggestion of tentacles, not hair, as beard. Similar use in Carolines, Sepik River country of New Guinea and Marquesas. One such in shop and dock area of Singapore. Not for sale. 10. Wooden figure, Sepik River. Notice A. Nose, a single tentacle, curling down and into figure below waist. B. Lower jaw, another tentacle, curling down, rejoining torso at umbilicus. Head grotesquely out of proportion. Living model? 11. War shield. Queensland, maze design, apparently A. Maze underwater. B. Squat anthropoid figure suggested at end of maze. Tentacles? 12. Shell pendant. Papua. Similar to above. It seemed manifest that my great uncle sought some very definite tendencies in these pieces, but whether the development of primitive art or of some object of representation was not clear. Presumably, however, it was the latter. For among the remaining pieces of unknown origin, there were two which were extremely suggestive in the light of my great uncle's cryptic notes. One was of a rough five-pointed star, made from some manner of gray stone unfamiliar to me. The other was an exquisitely made figure, just over seven inches in height, representing nothing so much as the figment of a nightmare. It represented certainly some ancient monster, or rather an aboriginal concept of an ancient monster, doubtless long extinct of anything even remotely resembling it had ever walked the earth. The creature was suggestively anthropoid in outline, but its head was octopoid, and its face was a mass of feelers resembling tentacles, while its body appeared to be at one and the same time scaly and rubbery looking. Its hind and four feet had disproportionately large claws, and something which resembled bat wings appeared to grow from its back. Because it was corpulent and its face of a horrible malignance, the squatting figure had about it an unavoidable force, a vivid, unforgettable impression of great evil. Not evil, as it is commonly understood, but a terrible, soul-destroying horror, transcending evil as mere men can know it. Its aspects was perhaps all the more fearful, because the cephalopod head was bent forward, and the aspect of the squatting figure was that of a creature about to rise, as it were to pounce forward. To its base, my great uncle had pasted but one brief note, more puzzling than the others. It read only, C or some other? Though my knowledge of such primitive art was, as I have admitted, comparatively slight, I was convinced that there was no link between the art of this strange figure and the known types of art with which I had familiarity of any reasonably well-educated individual, and this conviction served to make my great uncle's acquisition seem all the more mysterious. There was likewise no clue to its origin, at least 
as far as the figure itself was concerned. I sought this in vain, but nothing appeared, save only my great-uncle's strange question. Moreover, there was about this figure the feeling and the look of vast, incalculable age. This was unmistakable, for the material out of which it had been fashioned was a greenish-black stone with iridescent flecks and striations which suggested nothing geologically familiar to me. Furthermore, there were presently apparent along the base of the figure certain characters which I had initially mistaken for carving marks, yet it seemed clear after prolonged examination that these characters were not the haphazard slipshod scars of any carving tool, but rather carefully cut into the stone. They were in fact hieroglyphs, or characters of some language which bore no more resemblance to known linguistics than the carving itself did to the known types of art. Small wonder, perhaps, that I was soon persuaded to set aside my paper on the Creole culture and background in favor of some more extensive research into my great-uncle's papers. It seemed quite patent to me that, however secretive he might have been, he was on the track of something, and there were certain factors notably his card inquiring about pagan worship among the Creoles and his interest in the aboriginal pieces he had preserved, which tended to show that the object of his quest was very probably some form of ancient religion which he was attempting to trace back through the centuries in the remote corners of the world, where its survival was far more likely than in the metropolitan centers of our own time. My resolve, however, was far more easily made than carried out, for my great uncle's papers were nothing at all resembling order or chronology. I had hoped, because of the comparative neatness of their piles in the trunks, that they were in at least reading order, but it took me a considerable time to effect any sort of even primary arrangement, and an even longer time to establish a sequence of so sort. Though there was no assurance that that sequence was correct. Nevertheless, there was some reason to believe that if it was not, at least I could not be very far off, for my great uncle's travel notes permitted of some dating, since it was possible to discover where he had traveled and what the order of his travels was. It was also possible to hit upon the original impetus of his travels, so unlikely a way for him to pass his last years judging by his middle and earlier life. It seemed quite probable that some experience, a real or assimilated, associated with the two years during which he taught at Miskatonic University had set him off. But the immediate direction of his first travels apparently lay in a curious manuscript, which was evidently that of a castaway. How it had come into my great uncle's possession, I had no way of knowing that it was probable that the short newspaper clipping attached to the manuscript might have put him on its trail. The clipping was but a brief account of the finding of a manuscript in a bottle. It was headed, Lost Ship Mystery Solved, HMS Advocate Sank at Sea, and read, Auckland, New Zealand, December 17. The mystery of HMS Advocate lost last August appeared to be solved today with the discovery of a manuscript written by first mate Alistair Greenby. The manuscript was discovered in a bottle floating not far from the coast of New Zealand by a fishing crew. While it appeared to be in large part the raving of a mind already disordered by long exposure, the essential facts of the advocate's foundering seemed clear. After clearing Singapore, the ship was caught in the storm, which stepped down from the Curies in mid-August. It was at that time in south latitude 47 degrees, west longitude 127 degrees. The crew of the Advocate was forced to abandon ship ten hours after the storm struck, and while the storm was still raging. Thereafter, they were at the mercy of high seas, and if Greenby's account can be believed, of incredibly brutal pirates whose action decimated the men who remained alive as the boat bearing Greenby and his companions 
drove for the shore of an island, which was presumably one of the Gilbert or Mariana Islands. Such an island as that described by Greenbee, however, is not known to local navigators, who are inclined to cast doubt upon Greenbee's account following the forced leave-taking of the ship. The manuscript itself was written on the relatively small sheets of a pocket notebook and was pinned together. Though thick in pages, it was written in a shaky hand, and there were not many words on the page. Nevertheless, it was of substantial length, considering that its writer was very probably suffering from exposure and more or less convinced that he was doomed to die at sea. I am all that is left of the crew of HMS Advocate which set out from Singapore August 17 this year. On the 21st we ran into a storm, south latitude 47 degrees, west longitude 127 degrees, coming out of the north and blowing something terrible. Captain Randall ordered all hands to, and we did our best, but could not stand up against the storm in a craft, no more seaworthy than the advocate. At the beginning of the sixth watch, Ten hours after the storm hit us, the order came to abandon ship. She was settling fast. Something had torn her on the port side, and it was no good trying to save her. We got off in two boats. Captain Randall was in charge of the one, which was the last off, and I was in charge of the other. Five men were lost getting away from the ship. The water was running higher than I ever saw it and when the advocate went down, it was all the worse. We were separated in the dark, but we got together again next day. We had enough provisions to last a week, if we took care, and we figured we were somewhere between the Carolines and the Admiralties, closer to the latter and New Guinea. So we did what we could against the high seas to go in that direction. On the second day out, Blake got hysterical and caused an unfortunate accident. In the fight, the compass was lost. Since it was the only compass between the two boats, its loss was a serious matter. Nevertheless, we maintained, we thought, a course straight for the Admiralties or New Guinea, whichever showed up first. But after nightfall the first night, we saw by the stars that we were off course by west. On the next night, we were still off course, more so, if anything, but we could not be sure of our direction even after we had rectified the course because clouds came up and covered the stars all but the southern cross and canopus which could be seen just dimly behind the clouds for some time after the rest of them were down behind we lost four more men in those days siddons harker peterson and wiles went out of their heads then during the fourth night hewitt who was on watch woke us all up with a loud yell and when we were awake we heard what he had heard yelling and crying it sounded horrible coming over the water from where we judged captain randall's boat was but in a few minutes it was all over we tried to hail them but we could get no answer if it had been one of the men going berserk we would have heard but there was nothing after a while we didn't try any more just waited for morning, all of us more or less afraid in the darkness, with those terrible cries still ringing in our ears. Then the morning came, and we looked for the other boat. We saw it, all right, but there wasn't a man to be seen aboard her. I ordered the boat to make for her, thinking perhaps there still were men lying down in her. But when we came up alongside, there was nothing, not a sign of anybody except that the captain's cap was still lying there. I looked the boat over carefully. The only thing I noticed was that the gunwales looked slimy from the outside in, just as if something had pushed up out of the water and trailed into the boat. I couldn't make anything out of that. We cut away from the boat, leaving her just as we found her. We were not strong enough to warrant pulling the extra weight, and there was nothing to be gained by it. We didn't know which direction we were going now, didn't know just where we were, but we still believed we were near the Admiralties. About four hours after sunup, 
Adams gave a shot and pointed straight ahead, and there was land. We pulled for it, but it was farther off than we thought. It wasn't until late afternoon that we got close enough to see it fair. It was an island, but it wasn't like any I ever saw before. It was about a mile long, and though it did not appear to have any vegetation on it, it seemed to have some kind of building in the middle of it. A big black stone pillar stuck up there and down at the water's edge there seemed to be pieces of masonry. Jacobson had the glass and I took it from him. Clouds were up and the sun was near to setting, but I could still see. The island didn't look right. It looked like mud, even the high ground. The building looked wrong, too. I thought that the heat and the shortage of water was getting me. But just the same, I said, we wouldn't make for sure till next day. We never made for sure. That night, it was Richardson's watch up to midnight. But he was too weak to take it, so Petrie took it, and Simmons sat with him in case one should fall asleep. We were all dog-tired, having tried too hard to reach that land and overdoing it on the short rations we had, and we were all soon asleep. It seemed that we hadn't been asleep long when a yell from Simmons woke us. I was up quick as a cat and at his side. He was sitting there staring, his eyes wide and his mouth open, like a man in the extremity of fear. He babbled that Petrie was gone, that something had come up out of the water and just took him off the boat. That was all he had time for. That was all any of us had time for. The next minute they were all over us, coming up out of the water like devils, swarming up on all sides. The men fought like mad. I felt something tearing at me, like a scaly arm with a hand at the end of it. But I swear to God that hand had webbed fingers, and I swear that the face I saw was like a cross between a frog and a man, and the thing had gills, and it was slimy to the touch. That is the last I remember of that night. Next thing, something hit me. I think it was poor fear-crazed Jed Lambert, and he probably thought he was hitting out at one of the things boarding us. I went down and I stayed down, and that is probably what saved me. The thing left me for dead. When I came to, it was day by some hours. That island was gone. I was far out, away from it. I drifted all that day and night after, and this morning I put this down so that if I don't reach land, or if I am not sighted soon, I can put it into the bottle and hope and pray someone may find it and come back and get those things that took my men and Captain Randall and his men. For there is no doubt that is what happened to them too, pulled out of their boat in the night by something from the lurking hells beneath these cursed waters. Signed, Alistair H. Greenby, First Mate HMS Advocate. Whatever the authorities in Auckland thought of Greenby's statement, it is certain that my great-uncle viewed it with the utmost gravity, for following in chronological sequence, there was a very large assortment of similar stories, accounts of strange, inexplicable happenings, narratives of unsolved mysteries, of curious disappearances, of all manner of outre occurrences, which might be printed in thousands of newspapers and read with but the most superficial interest by the vast majority of people. For the most part, these accounts were short. It seemed evident that the majority of the editors themselves utilized them only as filler material, and it has doubtless occurred to my great-uncle that if the Greenby statement could have been treated so cavalierly, then other items might have similar stories behind them. Now it should be made clear that the clippings so carefully gathered by my great-uncle were similar in only one particular, and that is their utter strangeness. Apart from this, there was no apparent similarity among them at all. The several long accounts among them were of matters which were of some local concern. These were as follows. 1. A comprehensive resume of the facts concerning the disappearance of Dr. Laban Shrewsbury of Arkham, Massachusetts, 
to which were appended various obscure paragraphs copied from a manuscript or book by the vanished man entitled An Investigation into the Myth Patterns of Latter-day Primitives with a special reference to the real Ye text. For instance, the sea origin would seem incontrovertible, for every narrative of Cthulhu is related in some way, directly or indirectly, to the oceans. This is true whether it is of some manifestation supposedly stemming from Cthulhu, or whether an account of actions of his followers. One is not too certain of the validity of the Atlantis legend, yet there are certain apparent superficial similarities one ought not to dismiss without investigation. The focal points of the activities arrived at by simply establishing concentric circles throughout various maps of the globe would seem to be eight in number. One, the South Pacific, with the center of the circle being at or near Panape in the Carolines. Two, the Atlantic off the U.S. coast, with the center just off Innsmouth, Massachusetts. Three, the subterranean waters under Peru, centering about the ancient citadel of the Incas, Machu Picchu. Four, the North African country and the Mediterranean, with a center being in the vicinity of the Saharan oasis of El Negro. Five, North Canada and Alaska, centering north of Medicine Hat. Six, the Atlantic, centering in the Azores. Seven, the southern half of the United States, embracing the islands centering somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico. And eight, Southwest Asia, the focal point, a desert area in the Kuwait country, said to be near an ancient buried city, Irem, possibly the city of pillars. Two, an extensive inquiry with notes, however disjointed, of the mysterious invasion and partial destruction of Innsmouth by federal agents. Three, a weekly newspaper account of the disappearance of Henry W. Akeley from his hill country home near Brattleboro, with some mention of the horribly perfect representations of Akeley's face and hands found in the chair from which he had vanished, and some less prominent mention of terrible footprints glimpsed in the earth around the house. 4. A translation of a lengthy letter which had appeared in a Cairo paper concerning manifestations of strange sea beasts have seen in the waters off the Moroccan coast. There were many of the shorter clippings, but all, like the long ones, concern matters of the most bizarre strangeness, or with a suggestion of amazing mystery. There were accounts of strange storms, inexplicable earth tremors, police raids, or uncult gatherings, unsolved crimes of every description, unusual natural phenomena, narratives of travelers in out-of-the-way corners of the earth, and hundreds of similar matters. In addition to these clippings, there were various books, studies of the Inca civilization, two books on Easter Island, and baffling passages from books bearing titles of which I had never previously heard. The Seleno Fragments, the Noptic Manuscript, the Rilje Text, the Book of Ibon, the Sussex Manuscript, and the like. Finally, then, there were my great uncle's jottings. These were unfortunately almost as cryptic as some of the accounts he had so carefully hoarded, but it was nevertheless possible to arrive at certain conclusions regarding them. There was nowhere any concise summary of his findings, but there was manifest a certain progression which led to unalterable conclusions. From the tenor of his jottings, it was easy enough to gather. One, that my great-uncle was on the track of a loosely banded organization which worshipped one of a number of allied beings, the one specific object of my great-uncle's search being the central headquarters of the cult of Cthulhu, occasionally spelled Cthulhu with a K or Clululu, etc., and that some or all of the remaining art objects were related to the cult worship. Two, that the worship of this being was very ancient and very evil. Three, that my great uncle suspected 
that the curiously repellent stone image of unknown origin was an aboriginal artist concept of the being Cthulhu. 4. That my great uncle more than suspected a relationship between the untoward events of the clippings he had collected and the worship of this or allied beings. In this connection, his jottings are of singularly marked suggestiveness, as the following indicate. Certain parallels present themselves with damning and inescapable deductions to be drawn. For instance, Dr. Shrewsbury vanished within a year of the publication of his book on myth patterns. The British scholar Sir Landon Ettrick was killed in a strange accident six weeks after he permitted publication in the Occult Review his paper inquiring into the fishmen of Panape. The American writer H.P. Lovecraft died within a year of publication of his curious fiction, The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Of these and others, only Lovecraft's death seemed devoid of odd accidents. Some inquiry into H.P. Lovecraft's allergy to cold is indicated. Also note a pronounced aversion to the sea and all things pertaining to it, carried so far as to inspire physical illness at sight of seafood. The conclusion is unavoidable that Shrewsbury and Lovecraft too, and perhaps Ettrick and others as well, were close upon the track of some momentous discovery concerning C. Note the curious significance of the oasis name, El Negro. Roughly translated, this would be the Dark One, which in turn would signify not alone the devil, but any creature of darkness. No account available suggesting that either C or those directly serving him have come forth saved by darkness, except for the Johansson narrative recorded by Lovecraft, only his minions by day. Compare with the Greenby paper. Can there be any doubt but that the islands seen by Johansson and Greenby are one and the same? I think not. But where then is it? No record out of Panape, none out of Queensland, no mapped record of any kind. The Johansson account and that of Greenby agree that it must lie between New Guinea and the Carolines, possibly west of the Admiralties. Johansson hints that the island is not fixed but sinks and rises. If so, what is the explanation of the buildings? Everywhere evidence, direct or hinted, of fish-like or frog-like men, particularly in connection with certain events. Seen in Arkham prior to the disappearance of Dr. Shrewsbury, glimpsed in London just after the death of Ettrick. Greenby mentions beings that seem to him like a cross between a frog and a man. The Lovecraft fictions abound with them, and his tale of Innsmouth suggests a horrible reason why the frog-like servitors of Cthulhu would not want a dead man thus leaving Greenby to escape. Apropos, the Greenby manuscript compares such accounts as are available of the mysterious vanishing of the Marie Celeste and other ships. If sea creatures could board boats of such size as the Vigilant, why not larger ships? If the hypothesis is tenable, therein lies a plausible if incredibly horrible explanation for many a mystery of the sea, for countless derelicts and vanished vessels. On the other hand, the only accounts which might constitute direct evidence, it must be remembered, are those of men whose wits might have been jumbled by unaccustomed hardships. There were many more notes of a similar nature, but there were also others profoundly puzzling, evidently stemming from these primary notes. As my great-uncle delved deeper and deeper into his research, I found his notes tending towards growing obscurity. For instance, he wrote in one place, quite clearly under the stress of some excitement, could there not be some purely scientific principle involved in the time-space travel, reputedly the power of the ancient ones? That is to say, something related to time as dimension reducing Cthulhu and the others to utterly alien beings, subject to other laws, 
however antipodal to natural laws as we know them. And again, what about the possibility of atomic disintegration with subsequent reintegration across time and space? And if time is to be viewed purely as a dimension and space as another, the openings which are repeatedly mentioned must be fissures in those dimensions. What else? But the most disturbing aspect of my great uncle's strange quest did not make its appearance in his notes until the last few months of his life. Then there began to become manifest a marked uneasiness and definite evidence that the cult or cults in which my great uncle was interested were not phenomena of past time, but had survived into the present and were moreover definitely malign and evil. For there appeared in the body of the notes certain patent questions, put down for himself, as if my great uncle were asking himself questions, the import of which he could hardly credit. If I saw rightly, he wrote in one place, after returning from Transylvania, my traveling companion was of a marked frog-like aspect. His speech, however, was the purest French. Nothing to show where he boarded the Simplon Orient. It took effort to lose him at Calais. Am I being followed? If so, where can they have found out? And again, followed in Rangoon without doubt. Follower extremely elusive, but judging from a reflection in a window pane, not one of the deep ones in stature suggestive of the Chocho people, which would be a propos since their habitat is supposedly nearby. And yet once more, three in Arkham, in the vicinity of the university, the only question seems to be, how much do they suspect that I know? And will they wait until I publish, as in the cases of Shrewsbury, Vordens, and the others? The implications in all this were crystal clear. My great uncle, hard on the track of a strange, malign cult, had come to their notice, and his existence was menaced by followers of the cult. Then it was with instinctive conviction that I knew my great uncle's death in Limehouse was not an accident at all, but a carefully arranged murder. I come now to those events which confirmed my resolution to abandon my Creole project and take up instead the problem which had engaged the attention of my great uncle Asaf Gilman. My purely cursory interest had become crystallized at the conviction that my great uncle had been murdered, but when I began to cast about for some clue as to where to begin my search for his murderers and the cult to which they belong, I did not know where to start. Search his papers as I might, there seemed to be no one place to which or person to whom I could go in order to make a beginning. Despite all the terrible hints and suggestion of my great uncle's papers and books, there was no true focal point. Considered as a whole, the papers were more in the nature of preliminary work, leading up to hypotheses and conclusions which my great uncle had not had time to make. What resolved my doubts, as well as the obscurities of my great uncle's papers, was a series of extraordinary dreams and their even more extraordinary aftermath. These dreams began on the very first night after I had come to my decision in regard to my great uncle's search culminating in his murder before he had the opportunity to conclude his quest. The dreams were of a remarkable vividness and each was a singularly perfect unit with none of the haziness, the incoherence and the incredible phantasmagoria of most dreams. They were in effect astonishing in what they were vivid enough to seem not dreams at all, but clairvoyant and clairaudient experiences transcending natural laws. Moreover, each dream impressed me sufficiently to impel me to set it down for my future reference so that I might forget no single detail of the experience. My first dream then was as follows. Someone called my name, Claiborne. Claiborne Boyd, Claiborne, Claiborne Boyd. The voice was a man's voice, and it seemed to come from a very great distance 
and from above. I saw myself wake from sleep. As I did so, the head and shoulders of a man appeared. The head was that of an elderly man with long white hair, clean-shaven with a firm pronounced chin and full lips. He had a Roman nose and wore odd dark glasses with shields running along the sides of the eyes as well. Since I awakened, he said no more, but bade me watch. The scene changed. The head faded away and vanished. I, my bed, my room likewise vanished. The scene which came up in its stead was vaguely familiar. I passed along a street which appeared to be Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was away from the university and in a district where professional people live. There was someone I was meant to see here, and presently I found him. It was a tall, gaunt man, dressed in black. He walked oddly and wore a muffler and tinted glasses. Though he appeared to be a stranger in Cambridge, he knew just where he wanted to go. He entered a building and went directly to a suite of offices. The offices were those of Judah and Byron, attorneys at law. He entered the offices and asked to see Mr. Judah. After a moment of waiting, he was shown into Mr. Judah's office. Mr. Judah was a middle-aged man who wore pince-nez. His hair was beginning to gray at his temples, and he dressed plainly in gray. The suit was gabardine, the cut severe. I heard them talk. Good afternoon, Mr. Smith, said Mr. Judah. What can I do for you? Mr. Smith's voice was very strange. It sounded muffled and distorted, as if he had a speech defect brought about by overproduction of saliva. He said, I understand you represent the estate of the late Asaf Gilman, sir. Mr. Judah nodded. Mr. Gilman was engaged on a work in which I, as a fellow scholar, have a deep interest. I made Mr. Gilman's acquaintance in Vienna over a year ago, and I was given to understand at that time that he had papers and notes about his progress in his work. These papers cannot be of any conceivable interest to anyone but a scholar similarly interested. Can you tell me whether there is any possibility of my acquiring them from Mr. Gilman's estate? Mr. Judah shook his head. I am sorry, Mr. Smith, but Mr. Gilman's papers have gone to his next of kin at his special request. Perhaps I could arrange to purchase them from him. That is out of our hands, Mr. Smith. Can you give me his address, sir? Though Mr. Judah hesitated, he finally said, I see no harm in it and gave him my name and address. The scene vanished and the head of the elderly white-haired man returned. He told me to take care of the papers to conceal them in a safe place. Then the dream ended. Now, in itself, such a dream would not be unusual, following my prolonged study of my great uncle's strange papers, but its extraordinary vividness made such an impression on me, not only at my w waking after the dream had run its course, but throughout the following morning, that I was at last impelled to place a long-distance call to Mr. Judah himself and ask him whether anyone had made inquiry for me. My dear Mr. Boyd, what a coincidence! His voice came over the wire in precisely the accents of the Mr. Judah of my dream. We had a man in here yesterday asking after you, or rather, after your grand-uncle's papers, a Mr. Jaffet Smith. We took the liberty of giving him your address, probably a crackpot, but evidently quite harmless. He seemed to want to buy your great-uncle's papers, or at least to consult them. As may well be imagined, this confirmation of my dream had the most surprising effect on me. I had no longer any doubt whatsoever that Mr. Jaffet Smith was not a fellow scholar at all, but a representative of the same malign cult which had brought about my great-uncle's death. If this were the case, he would certainly come to New Orleans after the papers. What then to do? He was not likely to be deterred by my refusal to sell them but would undoubtedly take other means to obtain them. I determined, therefore, to lose no time in rearranging and packing my great-uncle's papers and moving them from my quarters to some place of concealment where Smith or any of his fellows would not be likely to discover them. I spent the afternoon, therefore, 
going through the papers once more. And in doing so, I came across two very curious jottings on the backs of envelopes. They were more than usually cryptic and both made pointed reference to the same subject. The first evidently made while my great uncle was in Cairo read simply, Andrada, surely not. The second made on his last visit to Paris just prior to his fateful visit to London read, Ask Andros about Andrada. I recognized these jottings at last for a direction in which to take up my great uncle's quest. But who was Andros, and where was he? I redoubled my efforts to find more information in the papers before me, some further clue to the identity of Andros or Andrada, but there was nothing. However, in view of the fact that both names were Latin in origin, it seemed fairly reasonable to deduce that their bearers lived in some Spanish or Portuguese-speaking country. And since my great-uncle's travels had taken him only for the briefest of times into Spain and Portugal, it was far more likely that these late objects of his interest were residents of some other place on the globe, from the Azores to South America. That it was in all probability South America seemed indicated, since there were enough hints in my great-uncle's papers to suggest that his next visit would be made to some South American place. But I had little time to speculate further, for the day was drawing to a close, and much work still needed to be done to make the papers ready for transportation. I was motivated not only by my curious dream and its confirmation, but by an even stranger conviction that I could not afford to lose any time whatsoever. I worked, therefore, with all haste, and by the end of the day I had finished. True, certain facts from my great-uncle's papers I had committed to memory, but all his books and papers themselves I had carefully repacked, and by the end of the day I had had them taken to the local express office and committed them to ninety-day storage, prepaying all charges with additional payment to cover subsequent instruction. That, if the two trunks were not called for, Within the set period, they were to be shipped to the library of Miskatonic University in Arkham. Following this, I had taken all receipts and mailed them to myself in care of Judah and by and Byron, with a brief covering note of instructions sent separately. When I returned to my apartment, darkness had fallen. Was it my imagination, or had someone been skulking about outside the building in which I stayed? Surely Mr. Jaffet Smith had not had time to reach New Orleans. I shook myself free of my fancies and grimly mounted to my apartment, half expecting to find evidence of unwelcome callers. But there was nothing, and I allowed myself a brief smile at the manner in which my great uncle's odd papers and my strange dream had taken hold of me. Brief, because I remembered, if my great uncle had been right in his speculation, that the cult of Cthulhu had members all over the world, it was certainly not impossible that there were some in New Orleans, and that Smith might well have reached one of them by telegraph. And indeed, had not my great uncle asked me to keep posted for any hint of strange pagan worship, by which surely he had referenced that of Cthulhu and those nebulous others? I put out my light and went to the window, standing behind the diaphanous curtains to look down into the street below. The quarter where I lived was one of the oldest in New Orleans. Its buildings were gracious, if old-fashioned. They were inhabited by artists, writers, and students, for the most part, and certain devotees of music from the immortals to the blues were likewise domiciled in the vicinity. The street, therefore, was likely to be lively at all hours. And now, between nine and ten o'clock in the evening, a still comparatively early hour, there was no lack of people. It took some time to isolate anyone who did not seem to belong to the street. Even then, I could not be sure. But certainly there was one individual, not plainly visible, who might indeed be watching this house, and my apartment in particular. He walked slowly up one side of the block and down the other, and though he never glanced in the direction of the house, he was aware of every opening and closing of the door. Of that I was as certain as if I had had incontrovertible knowledge. I was struck, too, by his gait, which was peculiarly shuffling like that of Chaffet Smith in my dream, and more damnably still, akin to that gait ascribed 
to the frog-like followers of Cthulhu in various of the accounts accompanying the papers of which I had now temporarily disposed. I drew back from the window, my mind in turmoil. Lacking any knowledge, I could not proceed against a casual walker on the street who might embarrass me by turning out to be a poet in pursuit of the muse, which would probably be as natural and really accepted an explanation as any that might be given. It was not too far-fetched to suppose that some attempt to get at my room might be made. However, after sitting for some time in the dark, trying to decide what I might do if our positions were reversed, I concluded that if the fellow below were actually a watcher, the course of events must have been as follows. Smith had telegraphed to put a watch on me and my apartment. The watch had arrived fortuitously during my absence with the trunks and would now stay perhaps changing places with someone else for part of the time until Smith himself could arrive. Presumably the members of the cult were not eager to create incidents by means of which keys to the presence might be afforded anyone curious enough to look for them. Hence it seemed unlikely that any sort of attack would be made until Smith has satisfied himself that no other course was open to him. Nevertheless, I waited in the darkness until midnight, only then when the street below was deserted and I could no longer catch sight of the watcher did I venture to go to bed. That night I had the second dream, which was even more startling than the first, though its full import was not destined to come to me for some days thereafter. As in the case of the first, particularly after the confirmation of that first dream, I made a full and complete record of it. The dream began exactly as did the first dream. The gray-haired man with dark glasses appeared as before. This time there was more than a haze surrounding him. In the background rose what appeared to be a great building of some kind. It was not clear whether the background was an interior or exterior, but there was a shadowy representation of what seemed to be a massive stone table between the head and the masonry behind. It was masonry of utterly alien construction, a great vaulted chamber, if an interior, the stone groinings of which were lost in shadow above. There appeared to be a round window of colossal size and monolithic columns besides which the head was incredibly puny. There were shelves holding gigantic books along the walls, strange hieroglyphs were visible on their backs. Indistinctly, carvings appeared to stand out on the monstrous megalithic granite masonry, the pieces of which seemed to con be convex topped blocks, supported by precise fitted concave bottom courses. No flooring was visible anywhere, but neither was any part below the chest of the individual who called to me. I was told to pay close attention. The scene faded. Once more a familiar street appeared. This time I recognized it at once. It was a street in Natchez, Mississippi, where I had pursued my studies prior to taking up the Creole study in New Orleans. I seemed to move along the street, but no one was aware of me. The post office came into view. I entered the post office. I went through the lobby, past the rows of boxes, into the interior of the post office. The postmaster and his assistants were at work there. No one noticed me. Now something very strange took place. The shelving into which letters were placed for shipment from the post office appeared to fade, and down behind the shelves I saw a thick letter. It was addressed to me, and I recognized the handwriting as my great uncle's. It was postmarked London the day before my granduncle's death. It was clear immediately what happened. The letter, like my great-uncle's last card from Paris, had been sent to my Natchez address and forwarded from there for it bore my New Orleans address alongside the scratch-out Natchez address. But somehow the letter slipped down and was overlooked. Now it was not seen by anyone in the post office. Once more I heard the voice of the man in black spectacles. This time he told me to mark his every word. Mr. Boyd, he said, his manner friendly but urgent. You must do precisely as I say. As you know, your apartment is being watched. Tomorrow Mr. Smith will call. It is not necessary that you see him. 
Sometime tomorrow, prepare to leave your rooms without the necessity of returning there. Make sure that you are not followed and go to Natchez. Retrieve the letter in the post office. It is from your great uncle and it is clear enough to enable you to follow instructions if you are still determined to do so. Take the utmost care that this letter does not go astray. Then the voice faded away. It is a tribute to the vividness of the dream that I did not for a moment question its validity. From the instant that I awoke in the darkness of my room, I knew that my great uncle's last letter lay lost in the post office at Natchez, and I knew too that with the coming of dawn I would set about to follow the precise instructions set down by my mentor in dreams. Go to Natchez and read my great uncle's final letter with every intention of following any direction it might contain. Despite a non-curiosity to come face to face with Japhet Smith, I realized full well that once he knew of my unwillingness to part with my great uncle's papers, it would be triply difficult if not impossible for me to elude pursuit. It was therefore with something akin to reluctance that I evaded my follower next day, for I was followed. I had not the shadow of a doubt about that, and my follower was an individual of suggestively repellent aspect, wide mouth, squat browed, lidless eyes, and almost earless, with an odd kind of leathery skin. I had no difficulty doing so by means of one of the most time-honored methods of avoiding pursuit, going into one door of a building and out the other. In Natchez, I could not, of course, hint that I knew of the existence of my great-uncle's lost letter. But I simply explained that I had come up from New Orleans to inquire after a letter I should have received and prevailed upon them finally, after my earnest and anxious entreaties to look behind the rack where I knew it to be lying. There it was found, amidst astonished apologies and given to me. By this time, I had long ceased to wonder by what agency I had been acquainted with this and the facts about Smith. That my dreams were not orthodox dream experiences was only too manifest. By what power I acquired this dream knowledge, I could not surmise. The tangibility of the letter in hand, however, overcame speculation. I opened it eagerly and read. A glance was enough to assure me that it was of the utmost importance, in so far as my great uncle's strange quest was concerned, and that it had been written at a time of great stress, when my great uncle no longer had any doubt about the identity of his pursuers, and when he had some intimation of his fate. My dear nephew, he had written, in a script slightly larger than his usual small writing, doubtless because of his agitation. I feel it incumbent upon me to take such steps as might assure me of some success in the search I have been conducting for many months, even if after death, for it is certain that my footsteps are dogged by some of the deep ones, day and night. Some time ago I made provision in my will that you were to receive my papers as well as a modest stipend to aid your work, whether it followed my own course or not. I make haste now to acquaint you with the nature of that work. Some time ago, let it suffice to say that it was after my retirement from Harvard, I stumbled upon a most curious and rare book, the Necronomicon by an Arabian Abdul Azared, a book concerning which perhaps the less expounded the better, for it dealt with a very ancient worship, with cults and cult rites, weaving an entire mythology which seemed at first glance to parallel the familiar creation story but which presently touched upon strange corners in my memory, so that before I knew I was deeply wrapped in the mythology of which it treated. This was candidly because I knew of certain events which seemed most oddly to verify some of the writings about so many centuries ago, and I determined, therefore, to study the subject with closer attention. One of those impulses which often come to retired educators would that I had turned away from that accursed book and forgotten it. For not only did I unearth evidence of certain damnable facts concerning the book and allied texts, 
which I studied, but I discovered that cults of people were devoted to serving ancient beings still in our own time. And I learned the truth of that strange couplet of the Arabs. That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. There is far too little time to tell you all. Believe me when I say only that there would appear to be indisputable and damning evidence that this earth, in common with other planets and stars in this and other universes, was at one time inhabited by beings not altogether of flesh and blood, or at least of that flesh and blood we understand, and not entirely of matter as we understand it. Beings called the Great Old Ones, whose mark are still to be found in hidden places of the world, the Easter Island pieces, for one, beings which have been expelled from the Elder Stars by the Elder Gods, who were beneficent, while the Great Old Ones or Ancient Ones were malign in intent in so far as mankind is concerned. I have neither time nor space to recapitulate this entire mythology to you. Suffice it to say that these Great Old Ones did not die, but were imprisoned or took refuge. This is not clear, but presumably it is the former, in great subterranean places on Earth and on other stars, and legend has it that when the stars are right, which is to say, when the stars are once again in the position in which they were at the time of the vanishing of the great old ones, a cycle as it were, they will rise again, the way having been prepared for them by their servants on earth. Of these the most dreaded is called Cthulhu. I have come upon evidence of belief in Cthulhu in all corners of the globe. In the far north, certain Eskimos carry on a ritual to the supreme elder devil, or Tonasuk, an image of which bears a striking resemblance to those hideous bas-reliefs, supposedly typical of the great old ones in appearance. In the Arabian deserts, as well as in Egypt and Morocco, there is worship of a fearful being of the sea. In queer, backwards areas of our own country, there is a devilish adherence to an ancient belief in things half frog, half man, and so on, without end. I became convinced that the worship of Hastur and Shub Nigarath and Yog Sothoth was less widespread than that of Cthulhu, and I set out to discover as many pockets of such worship as possible. Admittedly, I did so at first with the most impersonal of motives, but as the final dread knowledge came, that these servants were preparing to open the portals of time and space to beings of which our own science knows nothing and against which it is likely to be powerless. I ceased being impersonal, and I began consciously to attempt to learn the identity of the most potent of the groups following and serving the cult of Cthulhu, and the leader of that group, bent upon doing everything in my power to end the activities of that group even if it meant exterminating their leader myself. Though I am close to learning his identity, I am yet too far away. Somehow those hellish frogmen or fishmen, whichever they may be called, known as the Deep Ones, who are among the closest servants of Cthulhu, have discovered my activities. I do not know whether they are aware of my intention. They cannot be, for I have not heretofore set it down, or confessed it, yet they are watching me, as they have been watching for months past, and I feel that I may not have much time left. There is no good in burdening you with further details. I want to say only that if you decide to carry on, I think the most likely focal point of activity now is in Peru, in the Inca country beyond the old fortress of Salapunco. The first thing you must do is to go to Lima, call on Professor Viberto Andros of the university there. Tell him I have sent you, or better still, show him this letter, and ask him about Andrada. That, apart from his signature, was the complete letter. Accompanying it was a crudely drawn map of a terrain, utterly unknown to me and with no identifying key. Professor Viberto Andros was a short, thin man, 
venerable in appearance with silky white hair and an aesthetic face. His skin was dark, but not swarthy, and his eyes were black. He read my great-uncle's last letter with great deliberation, but with interest he made no effort to conceal. When at last he put it down, he shook his head sympathetically and expressed his condolence at my great-uncle's death, of which the letter was his first knowledge. I thanked him and asked the question I had to ask, regardless of such inner convictions as I had, whether in his opinion my great-uncle suffered from mental aberrations. I think not, he replied judiciously. Then he shrugged and added, but who is to decide this, as you call it, mental aberration? Neither of us, surely. You think it perhaps because of this? He tapped the letter. And his papers? But I am much afraid these things are true, as he has written. I do not know to what degree, nor whether more or less. Your great uncle was not alone in his belief. And there are books, manuscripts, documents, rare, well cared for in some of our great libraries, seldom consulted. But they are there written by people separated by centuries in time, by space incalculable, all treat of the same phenomena. Surely that is not coincidence. I agreed that it was not likely and asked about Andrada. He raised his eyebrows. It puzzles me he should press you to ask about him. I do not know why he wishes to know. Andrada, Father Andrada, is a priest a missionary among the Indians of the interior. In his own way, he is a great man, possibly even a saintly man, though the church hesitates to recognize him as such. The church is exceedingly careful in such matters, as no doubt you know, and that is well advised, since it is presumably infallible in spiritual matters, and it cannot afford to be an error. Andrada has worked for many years among the Indians, and I understand his conversions are numbered well in the thousands. For some reason, my great uncle believed you would give me some information about Andrada, which he sought. I said, choosing my words carefully. Would it be possible to see him in person? Is he in Lima? I'm sure he would see you, certainly. But the problem is to find him. His work takes him into the remotest places of the country. And as you know, we have many, since most of Peru is along the coast, and the mountains are difficult and treacherous, even for many of the Inca descendants. I went on then to inquire further about the myth patterns into which my great uncle had been researching, and in the course of our conversation it occurred to me to ask my host whether he knew anyone fitting the description of my dream mentor. I had no sooner mentioned the distinctive dark spectacles then Professor Andros nodded and smiled. Who could forget him, indeed? A very wise man. I met him many years ago in Mexico City, at a convention of educators there. I was much impressed by him. A South American, then? On the contrary, a countryman of yours. Dr. Laban Shrewsbury of Arkham, Massachusetts. But he is dead, I cried out involuntarily. That cannot be. Professor Andros turned his black eyes on me and gazed at me steadily for a long moment before replying. I wonder. I have said he was a very wise man. I do not mean merely in the assimilation of knowledge. He vanished, I think, and his house burned. But previous to that he vanished for twenty years and turned up again, after which he vanished once more, and his house was then destroyed. No corpus delecti was established. No part of any human body was discovered in the ruins of that house or elsewhere. I think a wise man would conclude only that his death was not proven. His eyes narrowed and he went on. But when you say it cannot be, you must have reason. What is it? Have you seen him then? Thus bluntly asked, I outlined briefly my dream experiences. He listened with grave interest, nodding from time to time. The description is right, he said when I had finished. The sound of the man seems right. I am fascinated by your description of his background, more than I can say. Ancient monolithic chambers, 
What a concept, and surely not of earth. How can one rationally explain such dreams, I demanded. He smiled wearily. My boy, how can one rationally explain oneself? Do not ask me. I took out the map my great-uncle had enclosed with his last paper and spread it before the professor, saying nothing. He looked at it for a long time, following the crude, hastily drawn lines, gazing intently at the little squares, those with and those without crosses, and the circles and rectangles. Finally he put a delicate index finger on the map and began to trace it. Here, he said, is Lima. This is a trail into the mountains, to Cusco, then there to Machu Picchu, and there to Sasaquan. There is Ollantambo, and along there the Cordillera de Vila Godna. Over here, surely, is Salapunco. The object of the map would be the area beyond. The trail ends there. And what region is that? A country largely unknown, and largely uninhabited. It is curious, this map. Right now there is much unrest among the Indians there, the kind of unrest which has no meaning, but which is ever menacing. He could not have known. But I knew intuitively that my great-uncle had known, how I could not tell. And I was certain that I had not come to the wrong place, that my great-uncle's researches we're leading him to the right source of the secret worldwide resurgence of the cult of Cthulhu. Somehow I must go into the interior. How will I know Andrada when I see him? I asked. Professor Andros placed an old photograph of the priest before me. It had been clipped from a newspaper and showed a man of burning, fanatic eyes and mouth, almost grim in appearance. His aestheticism and intensity were manifest in every aspect of his features. If you go beyond Machu Picchu, take care. You are armed? I nodded. You won't need guides until after Cusco. I wish you would keep me informed of your progress. You will find runners at Cusco who can travel from your camp with letters which can be sent in the regular way from Cusco. I thanked him and returned to my hotel, burdened with books he gave me, books containing transcripts of the Sussex manuscript the Seleno fragments and the Cults de Gouls of the Comte Erlet, books which contained in their pages the incredible legendary of the Elder Gods and their banishment of the great old ones from Beetlejuice, Azathoth, the blind idiot god, Yog sohoth the All-in-One, and All-in-One, great Cthulhu, said to lie dreaming in his great house in sunken Wilje, Hastur, the unspeakable, him who is not to be named, hidden on a dark star near Aldebaran, Nilar Hotep, abiding in darkness, Ithakwa, riding the winds high above earth, Kathuga, who will return from Formahat, Satkwa, awaiting in Nakai, all, all waiting upon the propitious time and upon the activities of their secret servants among men for a return to their dominions. A grotesque lore out of the remote past, but a lore with such an incalculable mass of supporting evidence, stretching from the most distant times into the present, as to be blasphemously shocking in its suggestiveness. I could well understand my great-uncle's desire to encompass his purpose, and I understood how imperturbable in the prospect of facing death he had been, the casual manner in which he could write of it against the urgency inherent and his desire to do all in his power to ward off the rise of Cthulhu's minions. I rode far into the night, long after the hotel was quiet and even the drowsy hum of Lima's night life had subsided. That night I had the third of the dream visitation of my mentor. Dr. Shrewsbury appeared as before, heralding his arrival by calling me by my name. This time there was no change of scene, but only the single monolithic chamber of the previous dream, with a doctor's head and shoulders struck out against that weird and impressively unearthly background. He spoke to me at length, warning me to acquaint no one with my purpose in seeking Andrada, urging me to take the utmost care, and once convinced of the object of my search, not to delay action. The leader of the cult must die, 
and as much destruction as possible must be wrought in the headquarters of the cult, which was deep in the interior beyond the ancient fortress of Salapunco. He went on to say to me that my escape from this country would be all but impossible, yet there was one way in which he might be accomplished. I must wait to go on my trek into the interior of Peru until I found at my disposal three articles, which would be delivered to me within the course of a day or so. These articles were, first, a field of golden mead, which would render me insensitive to travel in space high over earth, second, a five-pointed star, third, a whistle. The star stone, he explained, would protect me against the Deep Ones and other minions of Cthulhu, but not against Cthulhu or his body servants. The whistle would summon to my aid a gigantic flying creature, which would transport me to a place where my body would lie in suspended animation for an endless time, while my essence would join Dr. Shrewsbury far across the gulfs of interstellar space. After my purpose had been accomplished, and before the vengeance of the survivors could be wreaked on me, I was to drink the mead, carrying the star stone, blow the whistle, and repeat a strange formula, Ya, ya, hastor, hastor, and submit to whatever happened thereafter without fear. Extraordinary as this dream was, what followed it was even more so. As the dawn approached, I was awakened, so I dreamed, by the sound of great wings. Then, at the window of my room, I saw a monstrous, horrible winged creature. From its back stepped a young man. He entered the room through the window, placed something on my bureau, and went out the way he had come. The winged thing, only a very small part of which I could see, carried him instantly out of sight, the sound of its wings diminishing with great rapidity. Two hours later, when I awoke, I went doubtfully to the bureau, and there, exactly where I had dreamed, or had I dreamed it, lay three objects, a whistle, a feel of golden liquid, and a little gray-green star-shaped stone, the exact duplicate of that stone among my great-uncle's collected pieces, now reposing in storage in New Orleans. I shall start into the interior before the day is out. November 9th. Dear Professor Andros, I am encamped in the vicinity of Machu Picchu, and though I have not been here more than several hours, I have already happened upon some curiously disquieting facts. It came about through one of the guides who was retained for me through the agency of the fellow Santos, whom you recommended. Yesterday, while on the way to the ancient Inca citadel, I stopped some natives along the trail and asked them if they knew the whereabouts of Father Andrada. Crossing themselves, they gestured behind them and the direction we were traveling, but could give me no precise information. However, the guide in question rode up not long after and confessed that he had overheard my inquiry, and that if I did not fear to leave the trail at Machu Picchu, he would take me to his older brother, who lay ill at his mountain home not far away. I said I would not be afraid, so at the appointed place I rode with him perhaps three miles from the trail we followed, and I found his brother as he had described. Both men, I need hardly say, are of Quicha Iyer stock. The brother who appeared to me to be dying was a convert to Catholicism, one of Andrada's, though my guide, a much younger man, was not. Learning that I sought Andrada, he was at first extremely reluctant to speak, but as soon as he understood that I did not personally know Andrada and said that I was not a follower of the priests, he began to talk rapidly, as if he feared he would not have enough time to tell me what he wished to say. I cannot reproduce his language here, of course. He spoke in garbled Spanish, and the gist of what he had to say was extremely puzzling. He confessed to a great admiration for Andrada, amounting almost to veneration. But Andrada, he said, was dead. He was no more as once he had been. Andrada was not Andrada. He was another, whose honeyed words taught evil things. He said he knew where a paper from Andrada was concealed, and if I could spare his brother, he would send him there to obtain it for me. It would take two days on foot from this place. 
Naturally, I assented readily, and the guide has now gone on his mission. I make haste to report this to you. I do not at the moment know what to make of it, but the old Indian was much agitated, and his sincerity is not to be doubted. Moreover, he seemed relieved to be able to tell someone who might understand. I have the opportunity to dispatch this letter by the hands of a party of American tourists who have just completed a guided tour through the Inca ruins. I am yours cordially, Claiborne Boyd. November 10th. Dear Professor Andros, My guide returned last night with the paper reputed to have been written by Andrada. I have read it, and I conceive it to be of such importance that I am entrusting it to the hand of one of my runners to be taken to Cusco and mailed to you without further delay. The paper is evidently but a fragment of a larger account. I am at the moment about to remove my encampment into the gorge of the mountains beyond Salapunco, near which place I have been told Andrada is soon to conduct what I understand to be a revival or mission or some such similar affair. I am sincerely Claiborne Boyd. The Andrada Paper in Translation Who this fellow, or whence he comes, none knows. He is assuredly evil. He plays strange music on ancient pipes resembling flutes. Since he has come, there is unrest and wickedness abounding. Everywhere is evil, even in the clouds, and rising from the waters there are strange sounds, as if great creatures walked in subterranean places. I have inveighed against him, and I shall not cease my endeavors to overcome the evil teachings which are his. A great fear is upon my people. They speak to me of evil older than earth, of strange beings, and of one whom they name Kulu, or some such name who will rise again out of the sea and become master over all earth, and in time over the entire universe. I have questioned some of them as closely as their retinence would permit, and it is not the Antichrist they fear, but a being not a man, in their words, who was all this time before the teachings of Christ were made known to mankind. One of my people drew a crude picture of this being, as it was handed down to him from his ancestors. I thought I could see a representation of Pachacamac, to whom human sacrifices were made, or of Ilatichi Viracocha, but it was neither of these. Though it might have been a drawing of one of the supernatural monsters in which the old Incas had belief. It was a bestial representation of a creature which was a horrible travesty on man, squat, anthropoid with tentacles and a beard of serpents or tentacles, clawed paws or hands and winged in some fashion similar to bats. He has come preaching the worship of this being and predicting his return. I asked my people whether any of them remembered Kulu. None did, but some professed that their people in past generations remembered, but none had seen him. Many, I felt, sure concealed their belief in him. It is dismaying to observe this tendency among my people. I shall take steps to drive out the stranger, if need be, with a lash. Yet I am not unaware of a strong aura of danger, of mortal menace which abounds everywhere. Not the evil of Satanism, but a greater evil beyond that, more primal and terrible. I cannot define it, but I feel that my very soul is in the greatest danger. November 14th Dear Professor Andros, I have seen Andrada, as yet only from a distance by means of my telescope. The guides told me it would be dangerous for me to approach too closely. So I took their advice, set up my telescope, and watched his gathering. The man I saw in the cassock was not the man whose photograph you were kind enough to show me. Yet he was singled out to me as Andrada, and he played the part of Andrada. That is, he harangued the natives gathered to hear him. I should estimate them at three hundred, and certainly his harangue was not a Christian sermon, for he had them groveling. What I found most disturbing was the resemblance between him and the Japhet Smith of my dream. Certainly they were not one and the same. I do not suggest it. But it is equally certain that there is a relationship between them. For the Andrada I saw by means of my glass 
has that curiously frog-like mouth, those lidless eyes, and the strange pasty complexion associated with Smith. Nor was there any sign of ears. I think there cannot be any doubt but that Father Andrada has been killed, and someone is masquerading as Andrada for a far more horrible purpose than one might believe at first glance. And it is not too much to believe that he is one of the deep ones. Later, one of my native guides who mingled with the mission before Andrada has returned and tells me that Andrada spoke in a tongue foreign to him. Though it awoke something in memory, he says he may have heard it as a small boy. What has seemed to me most illuminatingly conclusive is a sentence, he says, was repeated over and over as a kind of chant by Andrada and repeated by his listeners. He strove to reproduce it for me, and from his attempts, I have no question but that it was a strange chant, heretofore recorded in various places and always associated with this dread worship of Cthulhu and Rilje, which has been translated to read, In his house at Rilje, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. Next morning, Dr. Shrewsbury appeared to me last night, apparently in dream. I put it apparently because I am no longer so sure that I am dreaming. I now understand far more of this grotesque and shocking cult worship. It would appear from what S. says that he has made use of certain servitors of Hastor who oppose Cthulhu's return to effect opposition, in fact, to the minions of Cthulhu. Hence the winged creatures of my previous dream experience. The mead, it would seem, is a soporific which has more than the ordinary properties of such drugs, but separates the self, the astral or spirit, I suppose one could put it, from the body, which is left inanimate but living. The body is transported to a place of safety, and the self takes another corporeal form in another place, but not the form of a man, a place far removed from our universe. Seleno in the Hades he is able to communicate with me at will by a kind of hypnosis. Andrada, he says, is as I suspect, but the headquarters of the cult is in a secret place of worship, once used by the Incas, an abandoned temple cut into the rock of the gorge not far from our camp. Andrada survived a previous attempt Dr. Shrewsbury made to destroy the door to Cthulhu at that place. I'm going there as soon as it is dusk tonight. Later. I found the meeting place. It lay at the end of a flight of steps, which began behind a hidden stone door opening into the solid wall of rocks out of the gorge, evidently an ancient Incan passage, for the rough-hewn stones were similar to those in Machu Picchu. The place of worship appeared to be an old temple of some kind, as described but there was no opening to the sky contrary to the religious custom. There was, however, a pool of some size. The room itself was of cavernous size, as I should have said at once, capable of holding, I should estimate, several thousand people. And from this pool emanated a hellish subquaceous green light. It would appear that the worshippers gather around the pool for the ancient altar at the far end of the room has been long in this use. I did not remain there long, for I was aware of strange stirrings of the water, and the sound of a distant music, as of worshippers were approaching, though on my emergence from the meeting place I saw no one. This is perhaps the last you will hear from me. Learning from one of my guides that an important gathering of some kind was to take place in the old temple room in the gorge tonight, I returned to the spot and hid myself. I had hardly completed my concealment in the recesses of the altar, when there was an ominous stirring and churning of the green lit in water, and something rose to the surface. What I saw there nauseated me. One glance sent me reeling backward. That I did not cry out and betray myself was due only to the fact that sight of the monstrosity risen to the surface of that subterranean lake paralyzed my voice. It was such a creature as can be dreamed of only in the wildest dreams of a sheesh eaters, a bestial travesty on humanity, a creature that seemed to have been once a man, with tentacles and gills, 
and a terrible mouth from which issued a series of eldritch raspings, similar to the distorted notes of a flute or oboe. When I looked again, it had vanished. I thought at once that it had risen up an expectation of someone's coming, and I was not wrong, for the sound of footsteps rang down into the cavern, and in a moment someone entered the strange glowing light emanating from the subterranean lake. It was Andrada, and in that light all those horrible fog-like characteristics of his features seemed most prominent. Without hesitation, I shot him. What happened then is almost too incredible to set down. Andrada, mortally wounded, seemed to collapse upon himself. He fell, but the cassock hit him, for he collapsed inside it. And then there issued from beneath the cassock a horrible, misshapen thing, a mass of convulsed flesh which slithered and hopped, hopped, and flapped towards the water's edge, expiring as it sank out of sight, leaving behind it only sandals, the empty cassock and the ornaments worn on it, a thing like a caricature of a frogman, arrested in evolution and molded together by some master artist of the terrible. Once again the water started to churn, but already I had begun to lay dynamite charges. I did not look back. I lit the long fuse at the entrance to the cavern and ran from that place. I have heard the explosion and my guides are nervous. I have told them they may return without me, for I know that I have no chance at all of returning along that trail alive. There is left only Dr. Shrewsbury's way. I shall not see you again, and I hope only that this final communication reaches you in time. I know that what I have done is little enough and much remains to be done in other corners of our world if we are to preserve it from the hideous and malign powers which lie in wait forever to return again. Farewell, Claiborne Boyd. Lima, Peru, December 7. AP. Despite an intensive search of the Cordillera de Vilcanota and the region around Salapunco, no trace of the body of Claiborne Boyd has been found. Boyd disappeared in mid-November while on an expedition to study native customs and cults, according to Professor Viberto Andros, whom Boyd visited in this city. The remains of Boyd's camp revealed only that Boyd left without taking his paraphernalia along. An empty feel was thought to have contained poison, but a chemical analysis of what remained in it revealed it to be only a serum of some kind, not fatal, though tending to paralyze and induce prolonged sleep. Investigators were unable to explain certain widespread marks about the tent, suggesting the marks of bat wings greatly enlarged.